Hey, good morning, and welcome to week five of the 2022 Watershed Wednesday series. My name is Melissa Urich, and I'm a member of the USC Wetlands team, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Watershed Wednesdays are hosted by the Upper Susquehanna Coalition and the Otsego County Conservation Association, and it is taking place of the Upper Susquehanna Watershed Forum for 2022. We'll be holding the sessions every Wednesday through November 2nd, and the full schedule and resources are posted on our website and on our Facebook page. The sessions are recorded and they can be accessed on that website. Our presenter today is Molly Hassett. Molly is a forester for the Bureau of Forest Management's newly created Carbon Forestry and Climate Section in the Central Office. Molly holds an MS in Environmental and Forest Biology from SUNY ESF and has previously worked in the Division of Lands and Forests Bureau of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health on various programs, including Southern Pine Beetle, Oak Wilt, Spotted Lanternfly, Hemlock Woolly Delgid, and Japanese Tree Lilac. Molly's going to give you an overview of the New York State Climate Act Forestry Strategies and Next Steps. All right, take it away, Molly. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. All right, let's get right into it. All right, so today I'm going to give a quick background on forests and carbon, and then quickly talk very briefly about some of the other climate benefits of forests, as well as forest resilience and vulnerability to climate change itself, and then give another really brief background on New York forest trends that have occurred in the past 30 years or so. And then I'll move into the Climate Act strategies and touch in on existing programs and some of the next steps and challenges that we're all facing. So very briefly, I just wanted to mention that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations are directly tied to global temperatures. And we've seen a huge increase in the last 150 years in those atmospheric carbon dioxide temp uh, concentrations. So of course, how do trees fit into all of this? Some background. Um, trees take in carbon dioxide from the air through carbon sequestration or carbon uptake and store the carbon in wood, roots, and leaves. So through photosynthesis, trees are kind of always taken in, in carbon dioxide as they're growing. And if you look at a tree trunk or tree branches, about half of the dry weight of wood itself is carbon that was once removed from the atmosphere by the tree growing. So carbon from the wood, leaves, and roots stays inside the tree or sometimes may move to other pools. So it might get turned into a wood product like a chair or the leaves might fall down inside the fall and go into the soil or the tree may put carbon directly into the soil through its root system in interactions with other species. Inside your typical forest, the majority of carbon is stored inside the soil, about 55% and about 30% of carbon is stored inside the trees themselves in the trunk, branches, and leaves above ground, and about 6% inside the tree roots. The rest, the other about 9% of carbon is stored inside fallen leaves and litter and deadwood. So that sometimes has implications for what practices are good for carbon or bad for carbon as well. Just something to keep in mind, I suppose. So as a forest grows over time, the carbon increases inside the forest, which is why older store forests store more carbon. But younger forests grow faster. So younger forests take in more carbon and are better at sequestering carbon earlier on. Usually this peaks about year 15 or 20 for the forests when they're really good at taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Of course, forests have many other climate benefits as well as other benefits. Specifically for climate, forests can be good at flood mitigation, stream bake stability, nutrient sediment retention, soil health, um, shading to reduce heat for animals that are nearby the trees or even inside communities, and building energy savings if the trees are planted close to a building. Of course, um, forests are already going to be vulnerable to some of the impacts that we're going to see from climate change. 
some of these impacts are already occurring. Um, we're seeing higher impacts from some forest pests like hemlock woolly adelgid is probably moving further north as well as southern pine beetle. A lot of invasive species we expect to get more competitive with climate change and hotter temperatures. Um, trees that are currently planted are likely already experiencing some more stress from climate change, like the late summer droughts that we've been seeing. Um, by about 2050, we're expecting to see a little bit less planting success and natural regeneration due to more summer droughts, as well as um, the planting phenology and flowering phenology for plants, which might affect how well pollination goes, as well as if the see or the flowers themselves stay on or if the buds are frozen off, depending on the flexibility of the timing of that phenology um, with the freezing temperatures and higher damage from storms as storms increase in intensity. Um, but we don't expect to see tree species changes until about 2100 because mature trees typically are pretty resilient to climate change. Right now, it's more worry about some of the younger tree species. So um, I already touched on some of this. So planted and newly regenerating forests are typically more vulnerable to climate change because those younger trees are more susceptible to things like drought as well as flooding. Um, whereas older mature trees are usually better at handling some of those challenge, challenges that come along. They've got more energy reserves to respond to those sorts of things. Um, forests that are dominated by conifers like spruce, fir, and some pines are expected to be more vulnerable, as well as coastal forests, which will be vulnerable to potentially things like sea level rise and storm surge as more intense storms occur. And um, forests along rivers and streams may be more vulnerable as well, just with the higher amounts of flooding, as well as like the more frequent flooding that we expect to occur. Um, forests that have higher species diversity are expected to be more resilient to climate change, as well as forests that are di dominated by more southern species like oaks and hickories, as well as lower density forests. When you have trees that are more spread apart from each other, they're typically getting more energy reserves because they don't have to compete as much, so they're better at resisting things like drought. Okay. So kind of moving back into sequestration and how do trees and forests help fight against climate change itself. Um, New York has 18.6 million acres of forests, and right now those forests are taking in more carbon than they release. So each year the forests are taking in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and they're holding on to it pretty well. It's not like some forests out west that are experiencing high wildfires, which some of those forests are actually emitting more carbon than they're taking in. So our forests are in a good projection as far as, I guess, fighting and mitigating climate change. However, um, sequestration from forests, so that carbon uptake has been decreasing over the years since about 1990, maybe even a little bit before that, because forests are still being converted to other land use types or developed. And as forests age, like I talked about a couple slides ago, their carbon sequestration decreases, even though they're still storing all the carbon that they have taken in, or a good deal of it anyway. So kind of thinking about mitigation, it's thinking about the balance of how much forests are taking in of carbon dioxide compared to how much is being released. So our forests have higher carbon sequestration than carbon emissions overall, but this might be impacted forest to forest based on things like drought or flooding, maybe site factors like nutrient light and what forest pests are there as well as things like what tree species are living there and how old they are. 
So fitting this all into Climate Act, which is the CLCPA abbreviated um, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, um, this act established the Climate Action Council to develop a scoping plan to meet some targets, specifically having 70% renewable energy by 2030, 100% zero emissions from electricity generation by 2040, and 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the 1970 levels by 2050. <clears throat> and overall with that act, there's a goal of 100% net zero emissions by 2050. So with that, the sequestration from forests, as well as other sequestration, is expected to be able to cancel out the remaining 15% um, of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's what the 85% reduction in emissions, if you had the 15%, you'll equal 100% net zero emissions. So trees are expected to be a big part of responding to climate change in New York through the Climate Act. Our current sequestration levels are about a little bit less than 30 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Um, you can see that dotted orange line I put on the graph there. Most of these um, most of the sequestration comes from forests. It's 92% from forests, about 5% from wood products. And right now we're at about 7% of New York State's emissions. So of all the emissions that are released, the sequestration in the state from forests, as well as the other land uses, equals about 7% of that. So there's a little bit of offsetting occurring already. Um, so the overall goal that was set by the Climate Act is expected to be about 60 million metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestration by 2050. So that would mean about doubling the sequestration in the state currently, which is a big goal, very ambitious. In the scoping plan itself, so we're at a draft scoping plan currently. Um, there are some strategies that involve forests, um, including protecting, restoring, and monitoring forests, including more forests in municipal land use pl planning and policies, uh, incorporating more sustainable forest management, as well as bioeconomy, which is all about forest products, really, and other products, I suppose. Um, so the first broad strategy, protecting, restoring, and monitoring forests includes things like keeping forests as forests, which is stopping forests from being converted, acquiring more forest land through state and local programs to help protect forests from being converted to other land uses or development, um, planting trees, which includes things like riparian buffers and silvopasture, as well as other planting initiatives maybe in urban forests as well. Um, support for planting trees also is included, like expanding DEC's nursery capacity and protecting and restoring wetlands is also included. So as far as implementation, right now the scoping plan talks about expanding existing programs like state land trust municipal forest acquisition programs, planting programs like soil and water conservation districts, trees for tribs, and other partners like the Upper Susquehanna Coalition and trying to work more with partners to expand planting, um, existing DC programs like Regenerate New York and urban and community forests. And it also includes some new proposals. One of the ones that was mentioned was a keep forest as forest law, which is as proposed, it's similar to like the wetlands mitigation law where forests would be avoided and then um, conversion of forests would be minimized. And if it has to occur, it would be mitigated through either a fee or planting forests elsewhere. For this specific strategy, some challenges and future needs are competing land uses. So of course we have to have agriculture and we have to have solar development and 
we have to have places for people to live, of course. So all of those things are going to play against each other and have to find ways to work together and collaborate to find the best land uses for the best locations. There's also a huge increase needed in seedling and tree production. The DEC nursery, for example, only um, grows, I think, 1 million seedlings each year or sells 1 million seedlings each year. And that will need to be hugely increased in the future to meet the goals of the CLCPA. Um, there's also seed and nursery capacity shortages, which plays into the nursery production rates and the ability of the nursery to do a good job, as well as old infrastructure. A lot of nurseries were made back around the time of the CCC um, or 1950s, so they haven't been updated in a while. So there's some good challenges there that hopefully we'll start to move towards addressing, addressing in the future. Including forest and municipal land use policies includes things like providing planting guidance and support to communities, as well as including forests in municipal comprehensive plans and providing more guidance for things like clean energy siting and development and just conserving forests in municipal lands in the first place as well. Um, Addressing and incorporating forests more into municipal planning and policies will likely use existing programs like the urban and community forest program that we have at DEC, as well as municipal comprehensive plans, smart growth, and of course, collaborate with NYSERDA, regional planning boards, and other local partners and regional partners across the state. So one of the largest strategies inside the scoping plan that has to do with forests is increasing sustainable forest management. And this strategy includes preventing and controlling forest pests, diseases, and invasive species, determining best practices for carbon uptake as well as carbon storage, assisting forest landowners with these practices, um, urban forestry, monitoring progress and research for these goals and education and outreach. We expect that sustainable forest management will probably also expand on existing programs like Regenerate New York, um, the AEM program, soil and water conservation districts, urban community forests, DEC and ag and markets rapid response programs for invasive species. Um, the US state DA APHIS was which does invasive species monitoring as things come into the state as well as into the um, country, and DEC prisms, which respond to invasive species region, regionally in New York. Um, some new proposals that were mentioned in the sustainable forest management section of the draft scoping plan were uh, tax law programs 480B and 480C. Right now, people can already get a tax break to manage their forest for timber. So that's doing harvests on their land. But these programs would likely give tax breaks for managing forests for other benefits or multiple benefits or managing forests for carbon. So they're not very developed yet, but there is potential there for new programs to help support forest landowners to hold on to their lands. So the last strategy I want to talk about that's in the scoping plan, the wider strategy, is the climate-focused bioeconomy. This strategy includes agriculture as well and other bio-based products. Some of the main things related to forests inside this uh, strategy was workforce development training, expanding markets for wood products and other bio-based products, creating sustainability guidelines for bioenergy products, and bio-based product research and support. Some of the existing programs I thought of were cooperating foresters, um, New York logger trainings, as well as collaborating with universities and partners. I think a lot of the research that's being done on bio-based products like bioplastics, as well as even some of the market 
information is being done at universities and by partners. So a lot more collaboration, I think, will be needed there to expand the bioeconomy strategy. Oh, and we're at the end there. So thank you, everyone. My contact information is there. And I will also be putting into the chat a link to the draft scoping plan. So I guess I'm ready for questions. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, while Molly is popping that into the chat, we do have a question that is queued up, but for everyone else, if you would like to ask questions, please pop them into the Q&A section, or um, we do have a small enough group. If you would like to speak your question, use the raise hand feature, and I will grab you an order and let you ask your question directly to Molly. So our first question, Molly, um, that we've got queued up here is, since tree species composition isn't expected to change due to climate change until 2100, or two, 2100, uh, <laughs> at what point um, should we change what species are being grown in nurseries and being planted? That is a very good question. I think, I think some of it can be done now. Some of it slowly over time will be how the transition can be best managed because trees that are planted are more vulnerable to climate change. So planning on planting trees that are at least slightly more resilient to climate change would be a good idea to start thinking about, but we also don't wanna necessarily rush it if we're still going to be having some cold snaps that might be limiting some species. So I suppose if you can plant species that are still going to be able to survive inside the plant zone, but maybe have a wider Southern range, that might be something to think about, but it is kind of hard to say. Awesome, thank you. Other questions? Folks, go ahead and use that raise hand feature or just pop them into the Q&A, like we said. Well, Molly, while folks are thinking about their questions, um, is there, for folks who want to get involved and learn more, obviously, they should take a look at the scoping plan that you shared. Is there any other resources that they should um, really connect with, you know, highly recommended from you to, to get further into this carbon sequestration through foresting? Sure. Um, so there is a Securing Northeast Forest Carbon program that has some really good, more in-depth webinars than the one I just gave with more of the forest carbon science, talking more specifically about some of the species. And that's been a collaboration between all the Northeastern states. Um, that would be a good place to start with more of the science information. Yes, obviously today, um, you know, with 20 plus minutes <laughs> to give it more of an overview. So um, if people wanted to to jump in and, and learn a little bit more, um, there's sounds like there's plenty of information out there. All right, Molly, I guess um, as an overview, you were very thorough. <laughs> Everyone, uh, all right, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with folks? Um, I believe the Climate Action Council is planning to release the no longer draft scoping plan at the end of this year. So I guess keep an eye out for it if you're interested. Perfect. Awesome. Um, well, this is um, a first and we will close up just a few minutes early. But Molly, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. And um, if anyone is like me and comes up with a great question later, Molly has obviously put her email address on the screen. So please feel free to use it. Uh, but we thank you and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Um, I am going to take the screen share real quick to show next week's presentation. Um, so join us next week. So um, we'll be talking about scaling reforest reforestation across New York State. Um, this presentation from today will absolutely be posted on the USC's website. So if you go to upperspecskohana.org slash USC watershed dash Wednesday, um, that's where you'll find all the presentations as well as all of the upcoming folks. So you can get an idea of what we have going on. So feel free to pop in there um, and you can take a look at all of our past presentations as well. We hope that you have a great day, guys. Thank you so much. And Molly, thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to reach out.